Good morning, explorers, and welcome. My name is Alicia, and I'm joining you from the Aquarium of the Pacific for our Summer Kids Club. I hope you're excited. We're going to be exploring all about some of the ocean's most unique habitats, a place where an animal lives. Now, before I get started, though, I want to invite you to participate with me. You can participate live as we're um, on air right now by texting in. We're going to put that text number there for you. Or if you're watching after we've gone live and you're, you're just full of questions, comments, things that you've noticed, you can share with us on our, our email at live at lbaop.org. Now, I'm not here by myself. I have my friend Carrie who's helping me with all the wonderful things that we're going to see um, behind us today. She's also going to be helping with your questions or comments. So feel free to text on in. So explorers, we're going to be learning all about the deep ocean. But before I get there, let's go ahead and start a little closer to where we live on land. In fact, I want to start with one of our local habitats here in Southern California, and this would be a kelp forest, because I really want us to compare the deep ocean to a shallower environment. So when I say shallow, kelp forests average anywhere from about 60 to 100 feet down. And that is really important to the animals that live there. And we're gonna talk about some of those things that they need and think about that as we compare that to a, a home, a place where animals live in the deep sea. So I want you to take a moment here and I want you to see if you can find not only a couple of the living things in this habitat, but I also want you to think critically about the things that are not living in this habitat, but that make it special or unique. Oh, hello. Hello there, friend. If only our giant sea bass would move out of the way. So take a moment. Hmm. Any ideas, explorers? Well, I notice a lot of fish in here. So even just noticing how many of something, we call that an abundance, or how different they are, that's diversity. So there's an abundance of animals here. There's lots of fish. Did you notice that too? Yeah. Are they all the same? Oh, I noticed that fish had a yellow tail. This one has polka dots, right? So that's diversity. There are many different kinds of animals. So not all habitats have an abundance, which is a lot of animals, or even different kinds of animals. So that's something to maybe pay attention to on our living side. What about our not living side? Hmm. Well, I notice that there's some shadowy places here, right? There's some places that light's coming through and some places that are a little darker. There's water. That's probably a good step if you have an ocean habitat. There's water in here, salt water. Hello there, fish. There's rocks. Now, to go along into our live category, I notice a lot of this algae, this seaweed, reaching towards that sunlight, and that's really important. So again, this is about 100 feet. Now, the ocean gets very, very deep. Hello. <laughs> so we're looking at a very large fish here. You can't really see in size comparison, but uh, this fish can get around <laughs> four to 500 pounds, just crazy. Some have been recorded at 600 pounds and longer than I am tall. But you know, in the deep ocean, that's pretty rare. We're gonna talk about that. Okay, so we've just investigated an entire habitat here and we're gonna come back because, you know, all of these animals have certain needs, right? They need shelter, they need food, and they need a safe place to raise their babies or have their babies. Ooh, look, a shark. So those are some things to consider as we think about a deep sea environment. So we're gonna change gears here, and my friend Carrie is gonna have us look at, at a picture of the deep sea. Now this is just one snapshot, and we're saying deep sea. Uh, this could be anywhere from you know 300 feet down to as far deep as you know thousands of feet down so what happens as you start to get deeper and deeper into this habitat how does it change 
What's really interesting is you can almost think about the ocean like lots of habitats starting at the very deepest part stacked on top of each other as you go up. I think we might even have an image of that on there, Ms. Carrie and I, because of the light. If not, we can take a look at it. Oh, here we go. So thinking about a habitat, again, are the mix of living and non-living things together. What's really changing the habitat here as you go down, we're measuring on this scale in meters, is how much sunlight travels through the ocean. So at the very top layer here, there is lots of sunlight. And sunlight's really important to start the entire ecosystem. So when we think about a food web, many food webs or most food webs start with the energy that is produced by the sun. And that could feed those tiny little plankton, those little drifting algae and plants in our ocean. It could help fuel that big kelp, that seaweed that we saw in the kelp forest. But it starts to go down. And eventually, in the deep ocean where these animals live here, it could get really dark. So how do the animals survive? So we're going to talk about some of those strategies. But again, I want you to kind of think about these different habitats. Another thing that changes is the amount of pressure. Right? Have you ever been in a swimming pool and you dive down and you can feel that pressure in your ears? Oh my, right? So that pressure is the weight of not just the water, but it's actually the weight of the air as well. So even though we're, you know, typically we do our days, we don't really think about air pressure, there is pressure from our atmosphere pushing down on us. And the deeper you go, the more you have both water pressure and air pressure. When you get to the deepest part of the ocean, they say it's like, taking a potion stamp, or you can make a little okay sign, and it's like an elephant standing just on that one piece. So if you're down there, it's like for every piece on your body, you would have a new elephant standing on you. Can you imagine? That's a lot of pressure. So this is a very unique place for those animals to live. The other thing we're going to talk about is that it's very cold without this sunlight to warm the animals um, in the deep ocean. It is often very Old. So why don't we start by talking about darkness and how some of these animals in this midnight zone survive. We can actually kind of see it boop, right here. <laughs> so some animals rely on their other senses. So they're very good at sensing by feeling. Um, they have, they can you know, sense the changes in chemicals in the water so they can smell the water. Um, some of them have very big eyes to help grab as much, especially the animals that are kind of in between right here. Some animals don't even use eyes. Some of them don't, some fish don't even have eyes in the deep ocean. Um, our giant squid here have eyes that are volleyball sized. So they're, <laughs> they're a big animal. Um, let's go ahead and look at a couple examples of animals that create their own light. So I'll have Miss Carrie pick whatever animal she would like. Ooh, is this what you were expecting? <laughs> this is a marine invertebrate. So an animal in the ocean with no bones in its body. And it likes to free swim around. It's kind of like um, a snail without a shell. It's cruising around and this animal actually glows. And why would that be important for this animal? Well, this animal likes to eat. You see all these little things that are stuck to it? It likes to attract tiny, very small drifting animals called plankton, and that will allow it to, um, to gather that plankton a little closer to its body. Sometimes animals use that bioluminescence, so they're able to create light to attract a mate. Sometimes they use it to confuse a predator. Sometimes they use it to find their way. And again, sometimes they will um, trick prey to come in, just kind of like that that angler fish that we saw it has a little light hanging off the front of its head. That is called a lure. Maybe we have another example 
of a bioluminescent animal. So again, these animals can create their own light. They can do it chemically, so inside their body using chemicals, or they rely on a partnership with a tiny little bacteria that can do that chemistry for them. So again, this is one of those adaptations. It's a very dark place to live in. So while Miss Carrie is doing that, I want you to think, what would that environment be like? What would it be like? Let's see, Miss Carrie, do we have another example or would you like to take a look at, at this habitat yeah, we're going to look at that video. So this video um, kind of captures a, a particular deep sea environment. And just, just to throw out there, um, it's not really this light. The underwater autonomous vehicle, so this vehicle is being controlled by a ship, it has its own light to it. So we're able to see the animals down there. But I want you to take a look. A lot of these animals have some really interesting colors. Ooh, a lot of animals are kind of prickly, right? They have extensions to them. So this is the very bottom. The bottom of the ocean, we call these benthic animals. Ooh, here's a free swimming fish. So again, this is from the NOAA Office of Ocean Exploration. So that's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So we have NASA for our space exploration. And we also we have in turn NOAA who helps us monitor our oceans and atmosphere, which is really incredible. And they do a lot of this research and a lot of the photos that we're looking at in video are from uh, their resources. So here's some deep sea, it looks like soft coral. And this soft coral is glowing. So again, some of these animals glow to attract um, other tinier animals to come close to them. So we're thinking about, you know, this habitat. Let's talk again about light and how that might relate to food resources. So we were talking a little bit about how there's a lack of, of light. And when we were thinking about Blue Cavern, a lot of that entire ecosystem, that food web starts with things like plankton and algae. And what that means is just like on land, we have herbivores that are able to nibble on plants and there are other things that eat them and that moves up the food web, right? And some animals eat a little bit of veggies, a little bit of meat. Well, in the deep ocean, it's, it's pretty hard, right? We don't have that sunlight to go down and feed those communities. So instead, we have um, a couple different ways that animals are able to eat. One of those ways is a mass migration. Have you heard that word before? Yeah, it's when an animal moves to get different resources. And so every, you know, every day, one of the biggest migrations on our planet are from animals that are living in the twilight in the deep zones, uh, traveling up to the surface where they can feed mostly on plankton and other animals at night, and then they travel back down. So for example, there's a lot of squid species that do this. They'll move up, they'll grab their prey, and then for safety, they live in those deep ocean environments. I think that's really incredible. So that is a, a migration that happens every day um, from the deeper parts of our ocean to some of those lighter parts of the ocean where there's light helping to help feed those ocean food webs. Another strategy you know, on land, that process of taking energy from the sun and converting it to energy is called photosynthesis. Photo means light. And synthesis is a chemical reaction, right? So that light reaction is creating energy. That's how plants and algae create energy from sunlight. And that energy moves through the food web and helps power, uh, power up the rest of the food web. Well, not too long ago, researchers were wondering how there was so much life in places that kind of look like this. And they realized that, wow, energy is not just coming from the sun. They found these hydrothermal vents. And maybe we'll, when Miss Carrie has an opportunity, she can put up one for us. And what's happening here is that there are cracks at the bottom of the ocean floor, 
where our tectonic plates meet. And these cracks allow seawater to, this very, very cold seawater, remember, jet in. Well, at the same time, you know, under our tectonic plates, it's very hot. So that cold water is, is being uh, both seeped in and then superheated and coming back up. Along the way, it's dragging with it lots of minerals that are liquefied in this heat. So you have this very cold environment, and then all of a sudden, you have these little pockets where these hydrothermal vents start to stack up because those liquid minerals, it's like liquid rock, are being shot up, and as they settle down, they create these little tubes that shoot up. So these hydrothermal vents have this superheated water. It's very cloudy. And believe it or not, there's a ton of bacteria, these microscopic organisms that are taking those chemicals and converting it to energy. And that is called chemosynthesis. So the process of chemical transfer of energy versus sun transfer of energy. And that is supporting these little communities at the bottom of the ocean. Um, it, you can't quite tell here in this photo, but these look like tube worms. And tube worms have a bacteria, that same bacteria, living inside. So it's kind of like a partnership. It's a symbiotic partnership. So this tube worm gets the safety, or so it gets food from the bacteria who's taking the chemicals here and transferring it to energy. And that bacteria gets the safety of the home of the tube worm. It's pretty incredible. So they live inside the body of this animal, along with, as scientists are learning, many other kinds of animals that live towards the bottom. So there are, again, there, are, there is this huge community of crabs and um, small, small invertebrates. Again, an invertebrate is an animal without any bones. So crabs and clams and mussels. So you have these um, superheated areas. What's really crazy is these areas are kind of unstable. All of a sudden, if there's tectonic plates again that move and shift, it could close up this vent. And so those animals will have to somehow relocate or they, they die. Um, so it could be a couple years, it could be a couple decades, you know, that you have these really active events. And scientists are very excited to continue to study them. Uh, we'll talk about how scientists are, are making their way to these very, um, you know, very hard places to study. But take a look. They've, this is a marked site. Um, and you can kind of take a look at how they're, they're taking photos and monitoring these. Ooh, we have a viewer, Caden. What does a hatchet fish look like? Um, so unfortunately, we don't have a photo right now of the hatchet fish, but they're very silvery with uh, clear fins, and they have a light-producing organ on their bellies. Oh, do you remember how we talked a little bit about that migration that happens, Caden, um, of animals that are moving up and down? So th they're not doing a huge part of that migration, but because you have animals that are gonna be below you in your habitat and above you, one of those ways that you can camouflage is sort of blend into your habitat when you're kind of in that in-between zone. You're not in complete darkness, there's a little bit of light, is to have that light on the bottom side of your body. So if a predator were to look up and it's lighter towards the surface, you would blend in more. And if you were a predator looking down, you don't have any lights on your back, so you would blend into the darkness. So that's really interesting, right? So hatchet fish use that counter shading, so having lighter on the bottom and darker on the top to help them blend in. For animals that live near the surface, and I'll give you um, an example, I think I have, there it is, a stuffed animal here, like a great white shark. They don't need lights to do it. They just have a lighter belly and a darker top. But if you're in the deep ocean, sometimes it's easier to have actual organs that are producing light to help you really camouflage. Another tactic as um, Miss Carrie helped um, provide some notes on the hatchet fish, but we did, we've had hatchet fish before here at the aquarium. It's just been a been a, a while, um, is to have clear fins. And that also helps it 
uh, blend into its habitat? But that's a great question. There are so many incredible animals. Now, because the resources are pretty scarce, so when we looked at Blue Cavern, right, we had a lot of animals living in a, in a small space. Here, you either have one resource and a lot of animals kind of clumped together, or the resources are really far away. And so animals that cruise along the bottom, like this fish, have to have some strategies. Some of these animals are much smaller. They grow very slow. So the hatchet fish is actually pretty small um, compared to like that big, you know, some of the big fish that we're seeing in Blue Cavern. So being smaller in body size and growing slower means you don't have to eat as much. And when you find food, you eat as much as possible. A lot of these deep sea animals have big mouths so that they can grab whatever comes along their way, even if it's almost the same size as they are, which I think is pretty incredible. So we'll see if we can find a picture. I think we have a poster view in one of our folders just to give a, a variety of some of those animals. We'll see if we can pull that up for you. This animal too, I don't know if you can see, it has these little extensions on its mouth. So even if the light's not there, they can actually taste the water with these little barbels that come out and they can help them find their food. Did you notice in that video that we were watching that a lot of the animals had these extensions to their bodies? Yeah, so a lot of them are trying to catch anything they can that's drifting from the shallower water all the way down to the deeper depths. And so a lot of them have either little tentacles that stick out or like this crab, they have um, these bigger claws. Some of them even have these um, claws that are kind of furry looking to help them like a broom sweep up as much of that mat material as possible. So what's coming from the surface? Well, honestly, it's things that have maybe passed away or died or organic matter in, in just a broader sense, like animal poop. Yep, kind of gross, but it is recycled material. So a lot of that kind of drifts down and some of those animals take advantage of, they call it marine snow as it drifts down. Now we talked about dead animals. Um, so their strategy is of eat what you can when you meet it. So you have big mouths or you have big teeth, even though they're not they're not very big animals in general. You have animals that are trying to take advantage of anything that drifts by them. So they have uh, tentacles or they have kind of these grasping and filtering arms. You have animals like tube worms that have a beneficial bacteria that live with them. Some animals are also scavengers. And so when there's a a uh, large animal that dies from the surface, like a whale. We call that a whale fall. So in part of that decomposition, right, when we think about our food web, we think about animals that are herbivores, so they eat plants and algae. We have carnivores, right, that eat um, meat. We have or an omnivores that eat a little bit of meat and veggie. And then we have our scavengers. And we have those that help with our decomposition. And so that decomposition is um, really important. It helps recycle those nutrients into an environment. When a big whale dies, it eventually will sink to the very bottom. And when it gets there, it provides food for animals for quite some time. Sometimes it's months to years and it is really incredible. So what we're looking at is a whale. There's lots of octopus. There's um, fish in here. Sometimes we even get uh, hagfish, which are pretty crazy. They don't have teeth or jaws. They use slime to help them remove food. So there's bone on here. And then you can see there's some of that extra meat. They're still working on it. A little bit earlier, did it look like it was fuzzy? Yeah, right here. Okay, I'm gonna tell you something kind of gross and cool at the same time. These are worms that specialize in eating bones. What? I know, isn't that crazy? Oh, here comes another fish. Yep, here they are. It's kind of, yep, <laughs> Osidax worms. They're, it's a very unique 
feeding strategies. There's not a lot of animals that can eat them. Um, so as it's saying here in this video, it is um, very, very unique, but it helps recycle all of that energy into the ecosystem. Oh, Kaden has had some really great questions. Kaden asked, why do deep sea dragonfish have red light under their eyes? Oh, that's a great question. So there are many animals that use lights, light in the deep sea environment like this in different ways. And it kind of depends on if either they're making the light themselves, or again, if they're kind of providing like a home for bacteria that helps them produce the light. So for, let's see, dragonfish. So there's dragonfish. Um, there's a couple other fish that can actually rotate so that you can see the little light underneath their eye at certain times. So sometimes it's to scare predators. Sometimes, again, it's to confuse. Sometimes they can flash those lights to attract prey. Um, I'm glad you're so interested in deep sea. I bet, I bet you know about many more of these fish than I do. I do know in general though, um, with dragonfish or just fish in the deep sea in general, that that light can be multi-purpose. And it's pretty incredible how in some of them they can even rotate it so that it's showing or not showing. All right, my friends. So again, thinking about how do we explore habitats like this? So we just learned about this unique habitat. I wanted to show you, thank you, Miss Carrie, this is one of those remotely operated vehicles. This is actually a very big vehicle. It's a big robot. It has to, um, they take a big ship out. They use a crane to drop it into the water. And then it's attached to this line here that can be hundreds um, of feet. Sometimes it's even um, up to like a couple thousand feet, which is incredible. That's a big boat that has to be able to unwind that and it has lighting aboard, and often it has instruments to take um, samples of the ocean floor. So instead of having a person, they have this robot. Here is the Smith Ocean Institute, and they have the sub bastion. <laughs> so it's common to name these um, underwater robot robots. Um, and you have to think, again, what's challenging about this habitat? There's a lot of pressure, right? So it's squeezing anything that's down deep. So you have um, a lot of this equipment has to be built so that it can withstand the pressure of the habitat, it has to have its own lighting, and then it has to have its own electricity. Can you find the arms on this robot? They're kind of tucked away. It looks like a praying mantis to me a little bit. Yeah, right here. And what's really interesting, do you like video games? Yeah? I like, yeah, it's for their fun. Well, if you like science and video games, there are people who specialize with the remote control to take the sample. So they're controlling from the vessel each of those arms. And so the arms can twist in all different ways and even very delicately with the little grabbers here, pick up a sample of something at the bottom. So remember, we're looking at that hydrothermal vent. Even though it's very hot, this um, instrument here could get much closer and be able to take a very small sample. Ooh, here it's taking a, a sample using that grabber. Thank you, Miss um, Carrie. So we have some deep sea coral, and deep sea coral is very, uh, very fragile, but this arm was very delicate, and so there's someone up there controlling to be able to take those samples, which I think is absolutely incredible. So with the use of the remotely operated vehicles are ROVs. There are ships out there to explore and even the use of sound. So they have the ability to map out the bottom. They're able to get an idea of what this habitat looks like. Well, I hope you've enjoyed joining us today. Uh, we do appreciate you joining us for our Summer Kids Club. We're gonna be talking next um, for our 12 o'clock class about how we learn about whale species. You know, what are some of the research techniques out there? You know, maybe you want to learn a little bit about whales in general. We're going to be talking about that at 12 o'clock today, and we have a few more classes throughout the week for our Summer Kids Club. You can always go to our website and find out classes and activities that are attached to those classes. And you can always share, of course, your discoveries at AOP Kids Club online. So that's hashtag AOP Kids Club 
online. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Take care.